So hello, I am Jan Erik Vinje. I'm the managing director of the Open Air Cloud Association. Uh, I'm very excited now to uh, invite you to this webinar where we will look into how there is an opportunity to work with our organization to write grants for the upcoming NGI Atlantic call. So um, next slide, please. <coughs> The goal of this webinar is to outline um, the opportunity for our organization to team up with American or North American uh, test beds for this third open call. Uh, and we, we would like to collaborate on experiments that leverage uh, enhanced spatial computing technology and provides opportunities for new uh, new research topics and uh, we have been working since 2019 on the open spatial computing platform uh, with together with our partners and we offer this platform to our uh, to those test beds um, the platform concept is heavily inspired by the open web platform so it's based on uh, core set of open standards and protocols, but it's intended for real world spatial computing. And we, we hope this approach will maximize the interoperability across the industries and across different technology domains. The platform, as we are called Open Air Cloud, it's designed from the human perspective to leverage air cloud technology. Um, but it's, it's a general uh, real-world spatial computing platform uh, that has the, the, the aspects of being decentralized uh, and, uh, and um, uh, flexible uh, for many other uses than, than AR. Uh, so we hope that you will find some value in both the, this platform concept for, for your test beds. And we also hope that you will you know, see the value in, in our partners and our community to contribute to your test beds. We have James Jackson on this call who will go through the details of the architecture of, of the open spatial computing platform. And we also have hopefully um, uh, uh, Vladimir from our test bed in Bari, Italy. And we have Gabor from uh, Nokia Bell Labs, who will go through some of the uh, some of the potential research topics. So before we hand it over to to Jim Clark, we'll um, try to define what is what is actually open. What is actually AR Cloud? What what kind of sort of technology is that? So next slide. So the core of AR cloud technology is a, a dynamic three-dimensional three-dimensional map um, that uh, is a machine readable representation of the physical world and that allows for a whole number of different uh, services and uh, architectures to build be built around that kind of data and yeah. A core piece of it is posi positioning technology. Another one is spatial discovery. And, and the third, which is very general, uh, very ambitious, is, is to try to find unified core scaffolding um, to describe the physical world in machine readable form. So yeah, uh, next slide. It is important to consider uh, the wider context of real-world spatial computing, because this is not just for, for AR and VR. It's equally important for, for 5G edge, IoT, smart mobility, smart cities, um, sustainability tech. So there's a point of convergence around real-world spatial computing for many of these technology areas. So the hope is that this human-centered uh, AR cloud approach gives access and interoperability to all of these uh, disparate technology areas that converge in the real world. 
So with that, I, I hand it over to Jim Clark. Okay, can, can you just give me host? Um, James, could you just advance to the next, next slide, please? Next. We, we have already integrated oh, two you of have. your slides, Jim, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so just the key features um, of NGI Atlantic um, are that we're funding open call projects between EU and US participants um, in areas related to next generation internet. Um, just and we're we're currently in our third open call, which um, you know has uh, just been pointed out is closing on the twenty sixth of February. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, the the topic areas for the call um, are the following. <clears throat> uh, it's twofold coverage, so EU US experimental platforms interconnection. Um, so this would be for mature uh, platforms, uh, enabling them to interconnect um, and, and carry out um, experiments and be available for the uh, remaining calls, um, number four and five. This was a new feature that we started in the last, um, in our second open call um, to, to get more platforms involved. Um, and then the, we've expanded our topic coverage to include two additional topics this time. So it's key enabling uh, NGI technologies such as IoT, um, AI, um, you know, VR and other technologies uh, related to privacy and trust enhancing technologies, decentralized data governance, discovery and identification technologies. And the new ones are strengthening internet trustworthiness with electronic IDs. Uh, and greening the internet, looking at a sustainable and climate-friendly NGI. And uh, just a very important point here, even though we're using the NGI initiative topics, which uh, have other open call funded projects, we're open to everybody in this, okay? So the main idea is to incentivize uh, EU and US teams to take some results as opposed to doing, you know, research and innovation activities, which should be done in the other NGI family of projects. Um, so we're more focusing on taking the results in these topics and uh, allowing uh, EU US teams to carry out experimental uh, platform um, uh, based uh, experiments on you know, both sides of the Atlantic. Okay, <clears throat> I don't have time to go through it here, but I have shared some additional slides which I really request that you look at because uh, in this open call, or on this website you have here, we explain that there are some particular expectations on the size of the projects that we will be funding. So <clears throat> it sounds to me like you're probably looking to do maybe a combination of the EU-US experimental platforms interconnection and one or two of the, um, of the NGI topics. So if you look at, at the uh, expectations that we have, you will see um, the types of projects that we will be funding uh, for for those particular um, uh, types of project. So it's it's not like our fir first two open calls in which we funded um, specific, uh, or we, we, I'm sorry, we didn't have specific expectations. And what ended up happening was uh, most, if not all of the participants put in the long-term projects with the higher, looking for the higher funding. So now we're looking to fund um, a mix of smaller term projects and longer term projects. The last thing I wanna point out as well, and again, I highlight this in my slides, um, the European Commission and the NSF are in sort of the final stages of talking about a, um, a specific supplement uh, fund program for existing NSF platforms. Um, unfortunately, I cannot say any more about that tonight, but um, uh, there is a, a meeting held, uh, being held, uh, or an audio call next week with the commission to kind of iron out the final details. So this would be uh, a big help to, um, uh, you know, to, to participants. Plus the NSF also have mentioned that the current supplement funds for the uh, PAWR program have been underutilized. And so they, they've been really telling us to try to promote these a bit more. And uh, both Yvonne and Colvis should be able to 
um, you know, to fill you in a bit more about those those supplemental funds uh, programs for because they're involved in two of those projects, Powder and um, and Cosmos. Okay, so I'll finish there and. Um, I don't think I'll be able to stay on. It's probably not really too appropriate for me to stay on for much longer. Um, <clears throat> but if you have any other questions, please let me know. And uh, uh, Christine, uh, thanks for the invitation. And, and please share those, the full set of slides that I sent. I think there's some important information there that the um, participants can look at. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Jim. So for those who are new to open air clouds, there's a little bit of information about what our organization is and what it is about. We were, were founded back in 2018 and we were essentially arising out of, uh, of the spatial computing industries, a lot of professionals, a lot of startups, some organizations that came together because we're very passionate about having open and interoperable uh, approaches to to this new technology area so we want to drive the development of those uh, those standards and protocols that can help uh, achieve that to connect uh, the digital and physical worlds and also we care very much about topics such as uh, privacy uh, control over private and sensitive data also on the government level or or uh, uh, other kinds of uh, such data that needs to be managed properly, safety, security, accessibility. So, so we want this type of technology to really help uh, benefit everyone um, and, and have a thriving ecosystem that, that is um, prosperous for, for all the participants. So we got 300 individual members, over 60 partner organizations, also, uh, last year, we created uh, a subsidiary uh, in Europe. Uh, Alina Kalovsky is on the call. Um, she uh, is the managing director of, of the European branch, and that's the branch that will uh, write the grant proposals uh, that is seeking support from, from other test beds in North America. Yeah, um, I think now it's time for James Jackson to go through the platform I've been speaking about. Thank you, Jan Eric. So I'm, I'm going to touch on the high level architecture for the Open Spatial Computing Platform or OSCP as we call it. Um, one of the key goals of OSCP uh, is for us to create open source reference implementations for the, the core components that you see here. And uh, hopefully you'll see today that um, this is an area where we've been making good progress. Um, on this uh, intro slide, I want to cover a, a couple uh, high level areas. Firstly, the, the color coding. Um, you'll notice that there are certain elements or components that we say are fully specified by OSCP. And so what this means is that not only are we specifying APIs and, and data models, but also the inner workings of um, that particular um, function. Um, there are other elements that are partially specified. And those are um, geopose service or positioning service as an example, and the reality modeling service. Um, partially specified for us really means that we're focused on the interoperability aspect. So, we're focused on standard APIs and data models, but not necessarily the inner workings of the implementation. So there may be different implementation options. Um, some may be open, some may be pr proprietary, but uh, the key goal here is that they're all able to interoperate. Um, lastly, there are uh, a couple elements here shown in orange that are not specified by OSCP but they are an important uh, part of the overall mix in terms of delivering the end-to-end -end experience. Um, those are really around the content hosting and any cloud rendering services, right? So our focus is primarily on um, bridging between the real world and the virtual world. So spatial service discovery, geopose and reality modeling, which uh, I'll touch on here. Now, in, in terms of where these elements um, 
reside. We'll start from the bottom. Let's assume that we've got a user with a 5G connected um, AR or smart glasses. Um, that device would uh, most likely be running uh, an OSCP SDK or library that facilitates um, simple communication with all of the OSCP services shown here. Now we have a, a set of services that live in a particular locale or geo zone, as we call it. Um, this could be a city or a town. Um, we assume that um, these would generally be located close to the end users and as such, most likely resident in some sort of an edge cloud. Now above that, at the top level, we have spatial service discovery. Um, so this is a, a bit like a DNS hierarchy. You could think of this as being uh, similar to a country top level domain. So spatial service discovery would most likely be operated by a, a foundation at the country level. And spatial service discovery essentially allows you to discover all these other services that are within specific sub areas. So it's really a, an association of coverage polygons and, uh, associate and services. Right. So I'm, I'm going to step through the, the sequence of interactions that a typical client would follow here. And we start off, the very first request would be to spatial service discovery. Right. So the client would provide some course information about its location. It doesn't need to be very precise. Um, and it would get back information about available spatial services in its area, as well as their specific coverage zones, right? Once it has that information, the next step for it is to connect to the GeoPost service to, um, to determine this GeoPost. Now, uh, GeoPose is essentially a highly accurate representation of the position and orientation in a common real world coordinate system. And we've been working with the Open Geospatial Consortium on standardizing this representation. Now, in addition to the standard representation, we've also defined a standard API that allows you to communicate with the GeoPose service, which is essentially a positioning service. Um, today, most of these are visual positioning services, um, but they could certainly include other technologies like 5G positioning, for example. So. Um, several of our partner um, companies that provide visual positioning services have already implemented support for this standard GeoPost protocol. So um, it, essentially the, the client is streaming sensor data such as images and GPS, um, uh, GPS information and getting back its accurate GeoPost. Right? Once we have the GeoPost, the next step is um, finding interesting spatial content around us. That could be um, 2D or 3D um, assets that have been placed around us. It could be richer uh, spatial experiences where there is a particular jumping off point in the real world to enter those experiences, right? Um, spatial content discovery, actually also spatial service discovery are, are both designed in a distributed or decentralized manner. So the idea here is that you have multiple providers that, um, that operate together in a peer-to-peer -peer mesh and essentially contribute to a common shared spatial index. Um, so in, in a way, this is sort of like democratizing search for the spatial web. The idea is if you have a piece of content and you make it public, that content should be available to anyone regardless of which service they're connected to. So we, we are trying to avoid this idea of you know, having different silos um, depending on services. Now within spatial content discovery, um, we have just lightweight JSON records that essentially have references to content that may be externally hosted um, as shown over here. And there's also the geopose associated with the content itself. So we can accurately place it in the real world. And we'll see more information on that as we go. The, the final step that's uh, of uh, interest uh, to OSCP is how we get this content to um, seamlessly interact with the real world. Um, 
the reality modeling service is really where this idea of a digital twin comes into play. Um, that digital twin would uh, include both static information like buildings and roads, uh, as well as dynamic information, people and cars. So there's, there's a concept of um, crowdsourcing information to create this model. And uh, of course, you can also subscribe to the model. And the, the idea is that we would have a, a standard protocol that allows for this structured representation of reality to be served to a client. The simplest early use case of this would be something like occlusion. So let's imagine that I've now discovered the content from spatial content discovery, but there's a tree that's between me and some of that content. So I need to be able to tell the device not to show me the content that's blocked by the tree, right? Now I, I mentioned here that spatial, the actual hosting of the content or cloud rendering um, are not really inside the scope, but uh, of course those come into play in, in terms of delivering the final uh, experience to the client. So I'll, I'll touch a bit more on a, a few of these specific services. Um, you'll recall that I mentioned the top level service here is spatial service discovery. And uh, you can see here that you've essentially got uh, um, 2D coverage polygons and then there are uh, associated services um, with those. Um, here I'm showing the GitHub repository um, that has the code for the core um, spatial service discovery service, um, as well as the GitHub repo for the client library that facilitates simple communication with this service. Uh, there's also a working prototype of it hosted here, and um, I'll quickly show this at the end. The, the other one was spatial content discovery. So this is the one that allows me to discover um, the, the spatial content that's available within a geo zone, right? So you'll notice that uh, in this case, we've, we've pulled in uh, a GLTF of Bender and uh, his geo pose, and we've been able to place him into the scene correctly. Um, again, as with service discovery, there's the repository for the code of the core service. Um, as well as the repository for the client library. And there's a, a running um, prototype that you can uh, interact with. Uh, in terms of the prototypes, um, if you want to create uh, new data, you would need an account, but uh, anyone is able to read the data to, to understand the, the current model. And this, uh, this last one that I'm touching on is the GeoPose protocol, right? So um, I, I mentioned that there is a standard GeoPose representation that we're working with OGC on. And then there is um, what is essentially a localization protocol. So this allows you to stream uh, sensor data from a variety of sensors um, into a positioning service and have it return your GeoPose. And uh, you, can, uh, you can see the repository here that defines um, that particular API. Um, as I mentioned, several partners, including Augmented City and Immersal, have already implemented support for that, uh, that GeoPost spec. Um, several of our partners have also integrated with the uh, spatial service discovery and spatial content discovery ser um, services. Um, there are uh, some demos and clients that I'll just reference here and uh, if, uh, if people have time, they can certainly look at them offline. Um, at this point, I will take a quick minute and, and before, jump through. Before you do that, I just notify that I pasted into the chat uh, the, the Open Geospatial Consortium's uh, GitHub repo. And the, the draft specification for, for GeoPose will be, be presented at that repository in, in uh, maybe within this week. Excellent. Thanks, Henry. Okay, so I'm going to drop out and I will show you a, a couple of the services here. Um, so the first one, spatial service discovery. Um, this is uh, essentially allowing you to interact with the RESTful APIs. It's uh, fairly straightforward and what we'll do here We'll specify the country, as I mentioned, this is operating at the country level. Um, and we're specifying a course 
um, position, which we use something called a H3 hexagon um, to sort of uh, provide the, this, uh, this location area. So essentially we do a query here and what we see coming back is a list of the specific services that are available. Um, there's the, the contact information for connecting to those services and the associated coverage polygons um, for those services. And this is a standard GeoJSON representation. Um, similarly, if we look at spatial content discovery, um, there's a, a concept of um, themes or topics um, where we can control um, synchronization of data um, by topic when we have uh, different providers uh, synchronizing. So here we're going to um, look specifically on this uh, history topic. Uh, once again, we're specifying a course position with an H3 index. And we'll get back the spatial content that is available to us. Um, here, uh, as an example, you'll see that we've got a, a 3D model of a cat, which is being provided both as a GLTF and a USDZ, um, so that we can support multiple client types. And here you'll see the geopose that is associated with that content. Um, the last one I will show is an example of a geopose. And what, so what we're essentially doing here is we're starting with an image and we have the GPS information for that image and we are going to localize it. Um, what's actually happening behind the scenes is that it's first communicating with spatial services discovery, um, providing that GPS information um, or, or rather the the H3 um, representation of position, uh, and it's going to find its GeoPost service. It'll then provide the GPS and image data to the GeoPost service, and it'll get back its GeoPost. So we'll do a localization. And here you'll see the GeoPost that was returned. So this is actually communicating with one of our partner uh, services, Augmented City and uh, they have built a, they have a uh, pre-built map of the particular area. So they're able to accurately localize this image into that map and return the standard geopose. Now we can place this representation onto a real world model. And what you will see here. So now we're seeing the image. If I zoom this, out a bit, you'll notice that that image has been nicely aligned with the 3D model in terms of the, the specific buildings and where it is exactly located. So that, that's all I wanted to show. And with that, I will hand off to... I think you're just gonna um, stay on your screen and Vladimir is gonna talk about the Bari testbed for a couple of minutes. Sure. Let me hand and then off to... uh, Gabor will um, introduce some of our uh, research topics. So there we go. And thank you. Thank, thank you. And I will hand off to Vladimir, who is the co-founder of Augmented City, one of our partner companies. Yeah. Hello, uh, Vladimir. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you a few words about our uh, test bed in uh, Bari, Italy. So far, it is uh, our biggest uh, test bed with uh, more than 100 square kilometers covered uh, by uh, by the 3D maps, and uh, it uh, fully uh, connected to uh, GeoPost server and uh, SDS server. Uh, so uh, it took us uh, just a couple of months to map uh, the whole city using just uh, usual mobile phones. So the average speed is like uh, 24 hours uh, per one square kilometer. Uh, then we placed uh, a lot of uh, objects um, in, the in different parts of the city. So in total about 5,000. This includes uh, usual information, 
speakers, uh, also 3D objects, uh, videos, so all, all, ki all kinds of objects. Uh, and uh, uh, also our uh, partners we work with, so businesses and uh, schools, uh, they also um, did some mapping by, by themselves and uh, placed different objects there. Uh, in addition to this, to, uh, to our test bed in uh, uh, Bari, that is the biggest one, we currently have uh, smaller spots in uh, 97 uh, other cities uh, around the world. So it's, it's, it's quite easy to take our tools and uh, start mapping and you, in, in, you immediately get uh, access to uh, GeoPost servers and uh, SDS. Uh, so how, how it works? Uh, okay, next slide, James. Yeah, switch next slide. Uh, it works exactly as uh, James uh, was uh, describing before. Uh, so we have a, a client that um, that uh, sends uh, the request to the uh, localization server, uh, sending an one image from from the camera. Uh, together with uh, some uh, approximate coordinates. It could be GPS or it could be just uh, approximate uh, position from a cellular network. Uh, like uh, 200 meters precision is, is enough for the localization to start working. Uh, then uh, this frame goes to the uh, main server uh, there it is localized. So we don't need to uh, download any uh, point clouds or anything to your uh, smartphone, to your device. Just send the image and uh, get uh, back uh, the uh, geopost using the standard uh, protocol. And then you uh, access another database. Uh, so you, you access uh, uh, content server and uh, download all objects that are around and visible. Uh, this uh, includes uh, occlusions, so you will see only the objects that are visible from, from your position. Uh, well, that's uh, actually how it works and it's, uh, it has proven to work quite well. Uh, the uh, total uh, time uh, per request is uh, less than uh, 200 milliseconds per, per localization. So actually sending data to server uh, to server takes much more time than the, the localization itself. So uh, 5G is uh, um, very uh, is, is of very big help here uh, to minimize their uh, waiting time for for uploading. Thank uh, you, Vladimir. I think yeah. we should go on to mm -hmm. Gabor. And if we have just questions about use cases, we can come back to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Christine. So in this last part of the webinar, uh, we briefly highlight some of the like, potential research topics that our collaboration in NGA Atlantic would, could enable. Uh, the shortest disclaimer, I'm uh, speaking with my academic hat and I'm not representing Nokia here. Um, but imagine how many interesting research questions, such a, a 5G testbed of yours and a citywide uh, spatial computing service on top, what we are building um, could enable together. So I listed here a few. Um, so first of all, um, to support the city scale of everything, uh, everything needs to be really highly distributed. Um, so one could investigate um, computation splitting between devices and the edge for all the aspects uh, like localization and reality modeling and, and also rendering, um, how to build these uh, scalable maps, how to efficiently search content, um, how to dynamically allocate uh, network resources or even uh, do peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication between devices in some, in some cases. Then um, precise localization, um, fusing, uh, fusing potentially multiple modalities. So you can use a 5G radio positioning, uh, plus GPS as course location, and then um, fuse that with the vision for, for five, a fine location. Um, and the vision has the advantage of uh, having orientation and elevation and, and, and these things. So, so this such, such a multimodal localization has advantages in, in really challenging areas where RF is blocked or, or GPS is blocked. Um, or, um, but the, the radio is of course beneficial where vision fails in textureless areas, for example. And because every camera is, a, is essentially a mobile sensor with a pose, 
uh, every query that we make to this uh, location service can also serve as an update, not only to the map and the geometry, but also as, um, as a real-time update for a situation awareness in the digital twin. Um, then reality modeling is, is about plenty of computer vision tasks where we really just started um, so creating these, um, capturing the environment with um, 3D semantically segmented, <clears throat> uh, like really building a digital replica of the space uh, and um, in, in many different representations, some are suitable for machines, some are suitable for humans. Um, and we don't really deal with rendering. Uh, we leave that more for, um, for other researchers, uh, but you can think about uh, situated visualization where, where we can show any 3D content plus even time um, in direct spatial context. So you can visualize IoT sensor streams uh, really at their location or, or even like volumetric signal strength map on, on stuff like that uh, in 3D. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so we can also think about a number of applications, uh, crowdsourcing these maps, uh, why people are playing games. This is a very interesting and popular approach in, in AR game companies. Um, then uh, we can think about smart city services or art installations even. Um, and from the research perspective, uh, I think it's low latency and multiplayer applications are, are probably um, yeah, the, the most, most interesting. Uh, then we put a, a lot of effort on, on privacy and security. <clears throat> So these, these location requests should be anonymous and this should really not be an ultimate tracking system. Uh, the history should be somehow um, not kept uh, and, uh, and cleaned. Um, the question remains, of course, who creates these maps, who, who owns these maps, um, the users or the positioning service providers or, or the cities. Um, this is still a question. Um, similarly, if somebody creates content and places it on the street, who, who is the, who's the owner, who is the, who's allowed to access it, who, who should actually uh, filter this type of content. Um, then we also um, deal with uh, security and um, security questions. Uh, so what, what happens if someone uh, sets up a fake location service or, or diverts some services or, or over, tries to overrun the users with, uh, with fake content? And you know, to be effective, all these AR systems have to constantly gather data, like maps of the environment or capture audio and video and location, which is really sensitive data and, and can possibly expose uh, information about the users, but also about business facilities and so on. So these this have to be really carefully thought through. Um, so we need to also define areas where, where for example, no augmentations are allowed and so on. Um, we do not focus on devices, but is of course uh, another very related topic. Um, okay, so in summary, um, this collaboration in the NGN Atlantic would benefit from both sides because uh, Open Air Cloud could be able to realize the first fully 5G uh, deployment, and the test beds would get a killer application service on top of the infrastructure, um, which bears really high potential for nice uh, scientific publications and in a number of these exciting research topics. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, next slide maybe. So that concludes uh, our webinar part.